chapter one of the maker of opportunities this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tony oliva the maker of opportunities by george gibbs chapter one it was two o'clock mr mortimer crabb pushed back the chair from his breakfast tray and languidly took up the morning paper he had a reputation in which he delighted of dwelling in a castle of indolence and took particular pains that no act of his should belie it there were persons who smiled at his affectations for he had a studio over a stable in one of the cross streets uptown where he dawdled most of his days supine in his easy chair the age was running to athletics so mr crabb in public had become the apostle and high priest of flaccidity he raised a supercilious eyebrow at tennis drawled his disparagement of polo and rackets and recoiled at the mere mention of college football but those highest in crabbe's favor knew that there were evenings when he met professional pugilists at this same shrine of aestheticism who at liberal compensation matched their skill and heft to his nor was he a mean antagonist in conversation for mr crabbe had a slow and rather halting way of making the most trenchantly witty remarks and a style exactly suited to the successful dinner-table and when a satiated society demanded something new it was to crabbe they turned for a suggestion mrs ryerson's gainsborough ball jack burrow's remarkable usher's dinner and the pet dog tea at mrs jennings country place were fantasies of the mind of this prester john of the effete when to these remarkable talents is added a yacht and a hundred and fifty thousand a year it is readily to be seen that mr mortimer crabbe was a person of consequence even in new york mr crabbe scanned the headlines of the sun while mcphee fastened his boots but his eye fell upon an item that made him sit up straight and drop his monocle hm he muttered in a strange tone so dicky bowles is coming home he peered at the item again and read frowning owing to the necessity for the immediate departure of the prospective groom for europe the marriage of miss juliet hazard daughter of mr henry hazard to mr carl geltman will take place on wednesday june twentieth instead of october the month at first selected crabbe's expression had suddenly undergone a startling change unknown in the platonic purlieus of the bachelors club the brows tangled the lower jaw protruded while the feet which had languidly emerged from the dressing-room a few moments before had partaken suddenly of the impulses which dominated the entire body he rose abruptly and took a few rapid turns up and down the room so they didn't dare wait poor little julie there ought to be better things in store for her than that and dicky won't be here until thursday morning it's too evident the haste he dropped into his chair picked up the paper again and reread the item june twentieth and today was sunday june seventeenth geltman had taken no more chances than decency demanded crabbe remembered the calamitous result of hazard's ventures in wall street and it was common gossip that had it not been for carl geltman the firm of hazard and company would long since have ceased to exist it was easy to read between the lines of the newspaper paragraph between the ruin of her father's fortunes and her own 
duty left juliet hazard no choice and here was dicky bowles upon the ocean coming back to claim his own it was monstrous mr crabb laid aside the paper and paced the floor again then walked to the window and presently found himself smiling down upon the handsome tops the very thing he said the very thing it's worth trying at any rate jepson will help and what a lark and then aloud mcfee he called get me a hansom mr carl geltman sat in his office of chamford oak and smiled up at a photograph upon his desk conscious of nothing but the dull ecstasy which suffused his ample person and blinded him to everything but the contemplation of his approaching nuptials the watch chain stretched tightly between his waistcoat pockets somehow conveyed the impression of a tension of suppressed emotions which threatened to burst their confines his rubicund visage exuded delight and his short fingers caressed his blond mustache it was difficult for him to comprehend that all of his ambitions were to be realized at once money of course would buy almost anything in new york but mr geltman had hardly dared to dream of this until he had seen miss hazard he had never even thought of marriage after he had seen her he had thought of nothing else after working late in his office geltman dined alone at a fashionable restaurant in a state of beatitude then lit his cigar and walked forth into broadway for a breath of air before going to bed the sooner to sleep the sooner would his wedding day dawn but the glare of the lights distracted him the bells jangled out of harmony with his mood so he sought a side street and walked on toward the river where he could continue his dreams in quiet until the hurrying thoroughfare was far behind he had reached a spot between tall warehouses or factories when he felt himself seized from behind by strong arms and before he could make an outcry something soft was thrust into his mouth and he had a dim sense of sudden darkness of hands not too tender lifting him into a carriage a brief whispered order a hurried drive more carrying the sound of lapping water and ship's bells the throbbing of ferry paddles the motion of a boat and the damp night air of the river through his thin evening clothes when geltman opened his eyes it was to fix them rather dully upon the deck beams of a yacht the rushing water alongside sent rapid reflections dancing along their polished surfaces at first it occurred to him that he was on an ocean steamer had he been married and was this he looked around no he was a good sailor but the vessel rolled and pitched sharply in a way to which he was unaccustomed he arose to a sitting posture and tried to piece together the shattered remnants of his recollection he felt strangely stupid and inert how long had he been lying in the bunk he remarked that he was attired very properly in pajamas very fine pajamas they were too of silk such as he wore himself upon the leather-covered bench opposite was a suit of flannels carefully folded white canvas shoes stockings upon the deck and other unfamiliar undergarments disposed upon hooks by the cabin door he rose suddenly his mind dully trying to grasp the situation he lurched to the porthole and looked out it was a wilderness of amber color and white rather bewildering and terrifying seen so near at hand for geltman had been accustomed to look upon the ocean from the security of fifty feet of freeboard far away where the leaping wave crests met the line of sky 
he could just distinguish the faint blue of the land he was seized with a sudden terror and turning he ran to the cabin door and tried to open it it was locked he threw himself against it and cried aloud but his voice was lost in the rush of wind and water without his despairing eye at this moment lit upon a push-button by the side of the bunk he touched it with his finger and anxiously waited there was no sound he sat upon the edge of the bunk conscious of a cold wind blowing upon his bare toes and of a dull ache within which proclaimed the lack of food or drink or both he rang again and renewed his shouting in a moment there was the sound of a key in the lock the door opened and a sober smooth shaven person in brass buttons stood in the door did you ring sir said the man respectfully i did said geltman wrathfully yes sir said the man can i get you anything sir can you get me began the bewildered geltman is there anything you can't get me get me some food my own clothes and get me get me out of this where am i what am i doing here you were sleeping sir said the man imperturbably i thought you might not wish to be disturbed geltman looked around him again as though unwilling to credit the evidence of his senses he saw that the man kept his hand upon the door and eyed him narrowly i've been drugged in shanghai what boat is this where are we we're at sea sir said the man quietly off fire island i believe sir fire island he cried and this as memory came back with a horrible rush what day is this wednesday june the twentieth replied the man calmly geltman raised his hands toward the deck beams and sank upon the bunk on the verge of collapse he remembered now it was his wedding day End of chapter one chapter two of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva as the fog upon his memory still hung heavily he raised his head toward the man at the door of the cabin that person was eyeing him rather pityingly and had come a step forward into the room shall i be getting you something sir he was saying again geltman sprang unsteadily to his feet no he cried i'm going to get out of this in pajamas sir said the man reproachfully geltman glanced down at the flimsy silk garment yes in pajamas he cried hotly and with an imprecation he strode past the outraged servant and rushed through the saloon and up the companion as he raised his head and shoulders above the deck he was immediately aware of a chill wind which was singing sharply through the rigging a gentleman in a double-breasted suit and yachting cap was standing aft steadying a telescope toward a distant schooner by his side was a short and very stocky man with a bushy red beard and brass buttons what is the meaning of this outrage he cried wildly addressing the man in the yachting cap are you the owner of this yacht the gentleman calmly lowered his telescope passed it to the bearded man turned mildly toward the tousled apparition and looked at him from top to toe while the sportive wind gleefully defined geltman's generous figure i say old man he said smiling hadn't you better get into some clothes C clothes be chattered geltman i've been drugged kidnapped shanghaied somebody's going to smart for this 
who are you what does it mean the enraged brewer with his arms waving his slender garment flapping his inflamed countenance and ruffled hair presented the wildest appearance imaginable the man in the yachting cap wore an expression of commiseration and exchanged a significant glance with the red-bearded man there now said he raising a protesting hand we're all your friends aboard here you're in no danger at all except he smiled at the brewer's costume except from a bad cold what does this outrage mean cried geltman anew you'll suffer for it as long as i have a dollar left in the world you really don't mean that said the gentleman go below now that's a good fellow get breakfast and some clothes no i'll not said the brewer in chilly syncopation i'm carl geltman of henry geltman and company and i want an explanation of this outrage the two men exchanged another look and the red-bearded one tapped his forehead twice with a blunt forefinger i haven't the least idea what you're talking about mr fehrenbach said the man in the yachting cap calmly fehrenbach cried the brewer my name isn't fehrenbach he screamed otto fehrenbach is on the east side i'm on the west my name is geltman i tell you the man in blue looked gravely down at the astonished brewer and pushed a bell on the side of the cabin skylight that was one of the symptoms wackerly he said aside to the man with the red beard yes doctor said the other quizzically the sea air ought to do him a lot of good geltman now bewildered limp and very much alarmed suffered himself to be led shivering below by the two blue-shirted sailormen there he found the steward in the cabin with a drink and the blue flannels and a boy laying a warm breakfast in the saloon he dressed at table he discovered an appetite which even his troubled spirit had not abated hot coffee and a cigar completed his rehabilitation his situation would have been an agreeable joke had it not been so tragic he had learned enough to feel that he was powerless that there had been some terrible mistake and that the only way out of the difficulty was through the somewhat tortuous and sparsely buoyed channels of diplomacy but he walked out upon deck with renewed confidence it was early yet if he could persuade his host of his mistake there was still time to run in shore where the telegraph might set all things right the man in the yachting cap was smoking a pipe in the lee of the after hatch will you please tell me your name began the brewer constrainedly with all the good will in the world said the other rising i'm glad you're feeling better i'm dr norman wolf of new york and this indicating the red-bearded man is captain wackerly of the pinta captain wackerly mr fehrenbach geltman started at the repetition of the name but he gave no other sign would you mind said the brewer telling me how i came aboard your boat not at all said wolf easily you see when i cruise on the pinta i make it a point to leave all thought of my cases behind but sometimes i break my rule and when they told me of yours i made up my mind i should like to study you under intimate and extraordinary conditions and so really i don't quite follow and so i had to bring you out to the yacht on which i was just starting for a little run over the azores the azores dr wolf was smiling benignly at the unhappy brewer you know he continued 
these cases of aphasia have a peculiar interest for me it seems such a little slipping of the cogs what's in a name after all yours is an old and honored one the fair and box have made beer for fifty years it's a lie shouted geltman springing to his feet unable longer to contain himself it's only thirty and the stuff isn't fit to drink pray be calm don't you know that if this was to get abroad it would hurt your business my business the business of geltman and company the business of fehrenbach and company interrupted dr wolf sternly the unfortunate brewer with an effort contained himself he knew that anger would avail him nothing the only thing left was to listen patiently he subsided again into his wicker chair and fastened his nervous gaze upon the distant horizon it's a pleasure to see you capable of self-control if you can i should like you to try and tell me how you happened to begin using the name of geltman how had he happened to use the name of geltman what would you say continued the doctor without awaiting the answer if i were to tell you that i was christopher columbus and that captain weckerly here was francisco pizarro or hernandez cortez you'd say we were mistaken wouldn't you of course you would when you say that you're geltman and we know you're fehrenbach stop roared the unhappy brewer springing to his feet stop for the love of heaven and let me off this floating madhouse calm yourself calm myself can you not see that the whole thing is a terrible mistake you have taken me for someone else last evening i tell you i was knocked down and drugged and then i was carried to a boat and broke here look at my clothes my handkerchiefs my linen you will see the monogram or initials c g will not that be enough to satisfy you my dear sir i assure you you were brought aboard in the very clothes you now wear even that cap was on your head can't you remember coming up the gangway with captain weckerly and then half aloud and with looks of misgiving toward the captain who was shaking his head he's worse than i supposed geltman had taken off the yachting cap and there perforated in the band were the letters o f he searched his pockets and found a handkerchief with the same initials as he did so he saw that the two men were looking at him with an expression of new interest and concern his mind was still befogged for the first time he really began to doubt himself and the evidence of his belated memory he had not heard that otto fehrenbach was mad was it possible that after all some dreadful misfortune had happened to him geltman that a blow he had received in falling had turned his mind and that his soul had migrated to the body of the hated fehrenbach and if so did the soul of fehrenbach occupy his body fehrenbach sitting in his office directing his business with the shoddy methods of the fehrenbachs driving his horses and perhaps could it be that he was at this moment marrying juliet hazard in his place the thought of it made him sick he was dimly conscious of some science which dealt with these things he had once read a story of a happening of this kind at a german university he looked at these strangers before him and found himself returning in kind their mysterious glances was he mad or were they or were, were they all mad together he glanced aloft at the swaying masts and the yacht too was it real 
or was that too some fantasy of a diseased imagination the fliegende holländer flitted playfully into his mind just forward of the cabin a group of sailors were standing looking at him and whispering it was uncanny were they too in the same state as the others it could not be the vessel was real geltman or fehrenbach he himself was real there must be someone aboard the accursed craft who would listen to him and understand bewildered he walked forward as he did so the group of sailormen dissolved and each one hurried about some self-appointed task he walked over to a man who was coiling a rope i say my man he said are you from new york yes sir said the man but he looked over his shoulder to right and left as though seeking a mode of escape did you ever happen to drink any of geltman's beer the man gave the brewer one fleeting look then dropped his coil and disappeared down the forecastle hatch the brewer watched the retreating figure with some dismay he walked toward another man who was shining some bright work around the galley stovepipe but the man saw him coming and vanished as the other had done an old man with a gray beard sat on a ditty box at the lee rail sewing a pair of breeches he was chewing tobacco and scowling but did not move as the landsman approached i say my man began the brewer again did you ever drink any of geltman's beer the old man eyed him from head to foot before he answered but there was no fear in his face only pity naked and undisguised no he replied spitting to leeward there ain't no beer in new york for me but otto fehrenbox geltman looked at him a moment and then turned despairingly aft the yacht was bewitched and they were all bewitched with her End of chapter 2chapter three of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva it's lucky olifaka's fat said mortimer crabb when geltman was out of earshot it was neat jepson beautifully neat did you ever see fish take the bait better but he'll be coming to in a minute captain jepson was watching the bewildered brewer he won't get much information there he grinned it can't last much longer though said crabb how much of a run is it to the coast about an hour sir well we'll keep her on course until eight bells then if he insists we'll run in and land him on the beach somewhere aye aye sir it'll soon be over now he can't get in until to-morrow and then crabb beamed with satisfaction and then it'll be too late stow your smile jepson he's coming back not even this complete chain of circumstantial evidence could long avail against the brisk air and sunlight in the broad expanse between the thumb and forefinger of his right hand geltman noted the blue of some youthful tattooing as he saw the familiar letters doubt took flight he was himself there was no doubt of that as he went aft again he smiled triumphantly let's be done with nonsense dr wolf he growled look at that holding his hand before crabb's eyes if i'm otto fehrenbach how is it that the letters c g are marked in my hand crabb his arms akimbo stood looking him steadily in the eyes so he said calmly you're awake at last he looked at crabb and the captain with eyes which saw not 
what he had thought of saying and doing remained unsaid and undone with no other word he lurched heavily forward and down the companion there'll be a hurricane in that quarter jepson or i'm not weatherwise laughed crabb we'd better run in now there isn't much sea and the wind is off shore we'll land him at quog or westhampton in the meanwhile keep the tarpaulin over the forward boat so that he can't see the name on her <laughs> we'll use the gig if he tries to peep over the stern we'll clap him in the stateroom it will mean five years at least for me if he learns the name of the blue wing so look sharp jepson and keep an eye on him never fear said the captain with a grin and walked forward crabb walked the deck in high jubilation he looked at his watch three o'clock if mcphee had followed his instructions dicky bowles and juliet hazard were man and wife he had nicely figured his chances to geltman he was dr wolf to his crew he was mr crabb taking an unfortunate relative for an airing to dicky bowles he was the rescuer of forlorn damsels and the trump of good fellows crabb was fully prepared to carry the villainy through to the end of one thing he was certain the sooner his guest was off the blue wing and safely landed the better and so when at last geltman came on deck with the watchful weckerly at his heels crabb noted the chastened expression upon the brewer's face with singular satisfaction i'll go ashore if you please he said quietly crabb affected disappointed surprise here now he said we're pretty far down the coast that's quog in there i can't very well run back to new york but put me ashore sir said geltman sulkily when the gig was lowered crabb bowed the brewer over the side his evening clothes tied in a paper package good-bye said crabb when you're done with the flannels mr geltman send them to Fahrenbach. but geltman had no reply he had folded his arms and was gazing stolidly toward the shore the last glimpse crabb had of him was when the blue wing drew off shore leaving him gesticulating wildly upon the beach in the glow of the setting sun when the figure was but a speck in the distance mortimer crabb turned away and threw himself wearily in his wicker chair where to now sir asked jepson oh anywhere you like sandy hook sir oh yes he sighed as well go there as anywhere else new york jepson poor crabb in twenty-four hours he was if anything more bored than ever the sight of the joyous faces of dicky bowles and his bride had done something to relieve the tedium vitae but he knew that their joy was of themselves and not of him and so he gave them a god bless you and his country place on long island for a few weeks of honeymooning he had even had the presumption to offer them the blue wing but dicky whose new responsibilities had developed a vein of prudence refused point blank crabb shrugged his shoulders suit yourselves he laughed it's yours if you want it and have geltman putting you in jail oh he won't trouble me how do you know i've made some inquiries he's dropped the thing are you sure oh yes he's not so thick-skinned as he looks that story wouldn't look well in print you know with an outburst of friendship dicky threw his arms around crabb's shoulders and gave him a bear hug i'll never forget it mort never you're the salt of the earth there there dicky salt should be taken in pinches not by the spoonful and you've must my cravat be off with you and don't come back here until matrimony has sobered you into a proper sense of your new responsibilities to your creator from the window of his apartment crabb watched dicky's taxi spin up the avenue in the direction of the modest boarding-house which 
sheltered the waiting bride then turned with a heavy sigh and rang for mcfee love like that never comes to the very rich he mortimer crabb was not a sentient being but only a chattel an animated bank account upon which designing matrons cast envious eyes and for which ambitious daughters laid their pretty snares no love like that was not for him or ever would be it seemed his toilet made crabb strolled out for the air wondering as he often did how the people on the street could smile their way through life while he a hansom passed turned just beyond and drew up at the curb beside him and a voice addressed him crabb mortimer crabb by all that's lucky ross burnett said crabb gladly i thought you were dead have you dropped from heaven man no laughed ross not so far only from china burnett dismissed the hansom at once and together they went to the bachelors club near by where over a friendly glass they gathered up the loose ends of their friendship crabb listened with new interest as his old friend gave him an account of what had happened in the five years which had intervened since they had last met recalling piece by piece the unfortunate events which had led to his departure from new york and burnett glad of receptive ears rehearsed it for him the boy had squandered his patrimony in wall street then by the grace of one of the senators from new york he obtained from the president an appointment as consular clerk an office which if it paid but little at home carried with it some dignity a little authority and certain appreciable perquisites in foreign ports he had chosen wisely at cairo where he had been sent to fill a temporary vacancy caused by the death of the consul-general and subsequent illness of his deputy he found himself suddenly in charge of the consular office in the full press of business with diplomatic functions requiring both ingenuity and discretion after all it was very simple the business of a consulate was child's play and the usual phases in the life of a diplomat were to be requisitely met with the usages of gentility a quality burnett discovered was not too amply possessed by those political gentlemen who sat abroad in the posts of honor to represent the great republic he thought that if he could get a post however small with plenary powers he would be happy but alas he had been away from home so long that he didn't even know whether his senator was dead or alive and when he reached washington a month or so after the inauguration he realized how small were his chances for preferment the president and secretary of state were besieged daily by powerful politicians and one by one the posts coveted even the smallest of them were taken by frock-coated soft-hatted flowing tied gentlemen whom he had noticed lounging and chewing tobacco in the willard hotel lobby it was apparently with such persons that power took preferment his roseate dreams vanished ross burnett was a mere state department drudge again at twelve hundred a year he told crabb that he had spoken to the chief of the diplomatic bureau in despair isn't there any way crowthers he had asked can't a fellow ever get any higher if he had a pull he might but a consular clerk the shake of crowther's head was eloquent isn't there anything a fellow even a consular clerk could do to win promotion in this service he continued crowther's had looked at him quizzically yes there's one thing if you could do that you might ask the secretary for anything you wanted and that get the text of the treaty between germany and china from baron arnim crowther's had chuckled crabb chuckled too he thought it a very good joke baron arnim had been the special envoy of germany to china 
accredited to the court of the eastern potentate with the special mission of formulating a new and secret treaty between these monarchs he was now returning home carrying a copy of this document in his baggage burnett had laughed it was a good joke you'd better send me out again burnett had said hopelessly anything from arakan to zanzibar will do for me crabbe listened to the story with renewed marks of appreciation so you've been out and doing in the world after all he said languidly while we eheu yam satis have glutted ourselves with the stale and unprofitable how i envy you burnett smoked silently it was very easy to envy from the comfortable vantage ground of a hundred and fifty thousand a year why man if you knew how sick of it all i am sighed crab you'd thank your stars for the lucky dispensation that took you out of it Rosellus was right i've been pursuing the phantoms of hope for thirty years and i'm still hopeless there have been a few bright spots crab smiled at his cigar ash a very few and far between bored as ever crab immitigably to live in the thick of things and see nothing but the pale drabs and greys no red anywhere oh for a passion that would burn and sear love hate fear i'm forever courting them all and here i am still cool colourless and unscarred only once his grey eyes lit up marvellously only once did i learn the true relation of life to death burnett only once that was when the blue wings struggled six days in a hurricane with hatteras under her lee it was glorious they may talk of love and hate as they will fear i tell you is the titan of passions burnett was surprised at this unmasking you should try big game he said carelessly i have said the other both beasts and men and here i am in flannels and a red tie i've skinned the one been skinned by the other to what end you've bought experience cheap at any cost you can't buy fear love comes in varieties at the market values hate can be bought for a song but fear genuine and amazing is priceless a gem which only opportunity can provide and how seldom opportunity knocks at any man's door crab the original the esoteric yes the same the very same and you how different how sober and rounded there was a silence contemplative retrospective on both their parts crab broke it tell me old man he said about your position isn't there any chance burnett smiled a little bitterly i'm a consular clerk at twelve hundred a year during good behaviour when i've said that i've said it all but your future i'm not in line of promotion impossible politics exactly i've no pull to speak of but your service i've been paid for that isn't there any other way oh yes burnett laughed that treaty i happen to know something about it when i was out there it has to do with neutrality trade ports and calling stations but just what the devil only knows and his deputy baron arnim won't tell arnim is now in washington ostensibly sightseeing but really to confer with von schlichter the ambassador there about it you see we've got rather more closely into the eastern question than we really like and a knowledge of germany's attitude is immensely important to us pray go on drawled crab that's all there is the rest was a joke crowthers wants me to get the text of that treaty from baron arnim's dispatch box entertaining 
said crabb with a clouding brow and then after a pause with all the seriousness in the world and aren't you going to burnett looked at him in surprise what get it the treaty the treaty from baron arnim you don't know much of diplomacy crabb you misunderstood me he said coolly and then with lowered voice not from baron arnim from baron arnim's dispatch box burnett looked at his acquaintance in amaze crabb had been thought a mystery in the old days he was an enigma now surely you're jesting why it oughtn't to be difficult burnett looked fearfully around the room at their distant neighbors but it's burglary worse than that if i in my connection with the state department were discovered tampering with the papers of a foreign government it would lead to endless complications and perhaps the disruption of diplomatic relations such a thing is impossible its very impossibility was the one thing which prompted crowther's suggestion can't you understand that crabb was stroking his chin and contemplating his well-shaped boot admit that it's impossible he said calmly do you think if by some chance you were enabled to give the secretary of state this information you'd uh, better your condition what is the use crabb began burnett it can't do any harm to answer me well yes i suppose so if we weren't plunged immediately into war with emperor william oh crabb was deep in thought it was several moments before he went on and then as though dismissing the subject what are your plans ross have you a week to spare how about a cruise on the blue wing there's a lot i know that you don't and a lot you know that i'd like to i'll take you up to washington whenever you're bored what do you say ross burnett accepted with alacrity he remembered the blue wing jepson and valentine's dinners he had longed for them many times when he was eating spaghetti at gabri's little restaurant in genoa when they parted it was with a consciousness on the part of burnett that the affair of baron arnim had not been dismissed the very thought had been madness was it only a little pleasantry of crabs if not what wild plan had entered his head it was unlike the mortimer crab he remembered and yet there had been a deeper current flowing below his placid surface that gave a suggestion of desperate intent which nothing could explain away and how illimitable were the possibilities if some plan could be devised by which the information could be obtained without resort to violent measures it meant for him at least a post at the helm somewhere or perhaps a secretaryship on one of the big commissions the idea of burglary flagrant and nefarious he dismissed at a thought would there not be some way an unguarded moment a faithless servant to give the thing the aspect of possible achievement as he dressed he found himself thinking of the matter with more seriousness than it deserved end of chapter three chapter four of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva a week had passed since the two friends had met and the blue wing now lay in the potomac near the seventh street wharf it was night and the men had dined valentine's dinners were a distinct achievement they were the kind which made conclusive the assumption of an especial heaven for cooks after coffee and over a cigar which made all things complete mortimer crabb chose his psychological moment burnett he said you must see that treaty and copy it burnett looked at him squarely 
crabbe's glance never wavered so you did mean it said burnett every word you must have it i'm going to help it's hopeless perhaps but the game is worth the candle a bribe to a servant leave that to me come come ross it's the chance of your life arnim von schlichter and all the rest of them dine at the british embassy to-night there's to be a ball afterward they won't be back until late we must get into arnim's rooms at the german embassy those rooms are in the rear of the house there's a rain spout and a back building you can climb to-night burnett gasped you found out these things to-day since i left you i saw denton thorpe at the british embassy and you were so sure i'd agree don't you think old man hang it all burnett i'm not easily deceived you're down on your luck that's plain but you're not beaten any man who can buck the market down to his last thousand the way you did doesn't lack sand the end isn't an ignoble one you'll be doing the administration a service and yourself why how can you pause burnett looked around at the familiar fittings of the saloon at the brown prints let into the woodwork at the flying teal set in the azure above the wainscoting at his immaculate host and at his own conventional black was this to be indeed a setting for machiavellian conspiracy crabbe got up from the table and opened the doors of a large locker under the companion burnett watched him curiously garment after garment he pulled out upon the deck under the glare of the cabin lamp shoes hats caps overcoats and clothing of all sizes and shapes from the braided gray of the coaster to the velvet and sash of the niçois he selected a soft hat and a cap and two long tattered coats of ancient cut and style and threw them over the back of a chair then he went to his stateroom and brought out a large square box of tin and placed it on the table he first wrapped a handkerchief around his neck then seated himself deliberately before the box opened the lid and took out a tray filled with make-up sticks these he put aside while he drew forth from the deeper recesses mustachios whiskers and beards of all shapes and complexions he worked rapidly and silently watching his changing image in the little mirror set in the box lid burnett fascinated followed his skilful fingers as they moved back and forth lining here shading there not as the actor does for an effect by the calcium but carefully delicately with the skill of the art anatomist who knows the bone structure of the face and the pull of the aging muscles in twenty minutes mortimer crabb had aged as many years and now bore the fizz of a shaggy rumsot the long coat soft hat and rough bandana completed the character the fever of the adventure had mounted in burnett's veins he sprang to his feet with a reckless gesture of final resolution give me my part he exclaimed i'll play it the aged intemperate smiled approval good lad he said i thought you'd be game if you hadn't been i was going alone it's lucky you are clean shaved come and be transfigured and as he rapidly worked on burnett's face he completed the details of his plan like a good general crabbe disposed his plans for failure as well as for success they would wear their disguises over their evening clothes then if the worst came vaseline and a wipe of the bandanas would quickly remove all guilty signs from their faces they could discard their tatters and resume the garb of convention ross burnett at last rose swarthy and darkly mustached 
lacking only the rings in his ears to be old gabri himself he was fully awakened to the possibilities of the adventure whatever misgivings he had had were speedily dissipated by the blithe optimism of his companion crabb reached over for the brandy decanter one drink he said and we must be off the night was thick a mist which had been gathering since sunset now turned to a soft drizzle of rain crabb hands in pockets and shoulders bent walked with a rapid and shambling gait up the street we can't risk the cars or a cab in this muttered crabb we might do it but it's not worth the risk can you walk it's not over three miles it was after one o'clock before they reached highland terrace without stopping they examined the german embassy at long range from the distant side of massachusetts avenue a gas lamp sputtered dimly under the porte cochere another light gleamed far up in the slanting roof crabb led the way around and into the alley in the rear it was long badly lighted and ran the entire length of the block i got the details in the city plot book from the real estate man this afternoon he thinks i'm going to buy next door i wanted to be particular about the alleys and back entrances crabb chuckled burnett looked along the backs of the row of in street houses they were all as stolid as sphinxes several lights at wide intervals burned dimly the night was chill for the season and all the windows were down the occasion was propitious the rear of the embassy was dark except for a dim glow in a window on the second floor that should be arnhem's room said crabb he tried the back gate it was unlocked noiselessly they entered closing it after them there was a rain spout which crabb eyed hopefully but they found better luck in the shape of a thirty-foot ladder along the fence a positive invitation whispered crabb joyfully here ross in the shadow once in the back building the deed is done quiet now you hold it and i'll go up burnett did not falter but his hands were cold and he was trembling from top to toe with excitement he could not but admire crabb's composure as he went firmly up the rungs he saw him reach the roof and draw himself over the coping and in a moment burnett less noiselessly but safely had joined his fellow criminal by the window there they waited a moment listening a cab clattered down fifteenth street and the gongs on the car line clanged in reply but that was all crabb stealthily arose and peered into the lighted window it was a study the light came from a lamp with a green shade under its glow upon the desk were maps and documents in profusion and in the corner he could make out the lines of an iron-bound chest or box they had made no mistake unless in the possession of von schlichter it was here that the chinese treaty would be found all right whispered crabb an old-fashioned padlock too crabb tried the window it was locked he took something from one of the pockets of his coat and reached up to the middle of the sash there was a sound like the quick shearing of linen which sent the blood back to burnett's heart in the still night it seemed to come back manifold from the wings of the building opposite they paused again a slight crackling of broken glass and crabb's long fingers reached through the hole and turned the catch in a moment they were in the room the intangible and quixotic had become a latter-day reality burnett's spirits rose he did not lack courage and here was a situation which spurred him to the utmost instinctively he closed the inside shutters behind him from the alley the pair would not have presented an appearance which accorded with the quiet splendor of the room he found himself peering around his ears straining for the slightest sound 
a glance revealed the dispatch box heavy squat and phlegmatic like its owner crabb had tiptoed over to the door of the adjoining room burnett saw the eyes dilate and the warning finger to his lips from the inner apartment slowly and regularly came the sound of heavy breathing there in a broad armchair by the foot of the bed sprawled the baron's valet in stertorous sleep his mouth was wide open his limbs relaxed he had heard nothing quick whispered crabb your bandana around his legs burnett surprised himself by the rapidity and intelligence of his collaboration a handkerchief was slipped into the man's mouth and before his eyes were fairly opened he was gagged and bound hand and foot by the cord from the baron's own dressing-gown from a pocket crabb had produced a revolver which he flourished significantly under the nose of the terrified man who recoiled before the dark look which accompanied it crabb seemed to have planned exactly what to do he took a bath towel and tied it over the man's ears and under his chin from the bed he took the baron's sheets and blankets in swathing the unfortunate servant until nothing but the tip of his nose was visible a rope of suspenders and cravats completed the job the baron arnim's valet to all the purposes of usefulness in life was a bundled mummy phew said crabb when it was done poor devil but it can't be helped he mustn't see or know and now for it crabb produced a bunch of skeleton keys and an electric bull's-eye he tried the keys rapidly in a moment the dispatch box was opened and its contents exposed to view carefully now whispered crabb what should it look like a foolscap shaped thing in silk covers with dangling cords said ross there under your hand in a moment they had it out and between them on the desk there it was in all truth written in two columns chinese on the one side french on the other are you sure said crabb sure sure as i'm a thief in the night then sit and write man write as you've never wrote before i'll listen and watch ramses the second in the twenty minutes during which burnett fearfully wrote crabb stood listening at the doors and windows for sounds of servants or approaching carriages the man swaddled in the sheets made a few futile struggles and then subsided burnett's eyes gleamed other eyes than his would gleam at what he saw and wrote when he finished he closed the document removed all traces of his work replaced it in the iron box and shut the lid he dropped the precious sheets into an inner pocket and was moving toward the window when crabb seized him by the arm there was a step in the hallway without and the door opened there stout and grizzled his walrus moustache bristling with surprise in all the distinction of gold lace and orders stood baron arnim end of chapter four chapter five of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva for a moment there was no sound the burglars looked at the baron and the baron looked at the burglars mouths and eyes open alike then even before crabb could display his intimidating revolver the german had disappeared through the door screaming at the top of his lungs quick out of the window said crabb helping burnett over the sill down you go i'll follow don't fall if you miss your footing we're ruined burnett scrambled out over the coping and down the ladder crabb almost on his fingers but they reached the yard in safety and were out in the alley running in the shadow of the fence before a venturesome head stuck forth from the open window and a revolver blazed into the vacant air the devil said crabb they'll have every copper in the city on us in a minute this way he turned into a narrow alley at right angles to the other 
off with a coat as you go now the mustache and grease paint take your time into this sewer with the coats so two gentlemen in light top coats one in a cap the other in a hat walked up in street arm in arm thickly singing their shirt fronts and hair were rumpled their legs were not too steady and they clung affectionately to each other for support and sang thickly a window flew up and a tousled head appeared hey yelled a voice burglars in the alley burglars said one of the singers and then go to bed you're drunk more sounds of windows the blowing of night whistles and hurrying feet still the revellers sang on a stout policeman clamorous and bellicose broke in did you see em did you see em he cried glaring into their faces bleary eyes returned his look uh, who said the voices in unison burglars roared the copper if i wasn't busy i'd run ye in and he was off at full speed on his vagrant mission lucky you're busy old chap muttered crabb to the departing figure do sober up a little ross or we'll never get away and don't jostle me so for i clank like a bellwether slowly the pair made their way to thomas circle and vermont avenue where the sounds of commotion were lost in the noises of the night at l street burnett straightened up lord he gasped but that was close not as close as it looked said crabb coolly a white shot front does wonders with a copper it was better than a knock on the head and a run for it in the meanwhile ross for the love of heaven help me with some of the bric-a-brac and with that he handed burnett a gold pin tray a silver box and a watch fob burnett soberly examined the spoils i only wish we could have done without that and had arnim know what we were driving for never ross i'll pawn them in new york for as little as i can and send von schlichter the tickets won't that do i suppose it must said burnett dubiously by three o'clock they were on the blue wing again burnett with mingled feelings of doubt and satisfaction crab afire with the achievement rasselas was a fool ross a malcontent a fainéant life is amazing bewitching consummate and then gaily here's a health boy a long life to the new ambassador to the court of st james but ross did not go to the court of st james in the following winter to the surprise of many the president gave him a special mission to prepare a trade treaty with peru baron arnim in due course recovered his bric-a-brac meanwhile emperor william mystified at the amazing sagacity of the secretary of state in the eastern question continues the building of a mighty navy in the fear that one day the upstart nation across the ocean will bring the questions complicating them to an issue but life was no longer amusing bewitching or consummate to crab the flavor of an adventure gone from his mouth the commonplace became more flat and tasteless than before life was all pale drabs and greys again to make matters worse he had been obliged to make a business visit in philadelphia and this filled the cup of insipidity to the brim he was almost ready to wish that his benighted forebears had never owned the coal mines in pennsylvania to which he had fallen heir for it seemed there were many matters to be settled contracts to be signed and leases to be drawn by his attorney in the sleepy city and it would be several days he discovered before he could get off to newport not even the blue wing was at his disposal for an accident in the engine-room had laid her out of commission for two weeks at least so he resigned himself to the inevitable and took a room at a hotel grimly determined to see the matter through 
conscious meanwhile of a fervid hope that the unusual might happen the lightning might strike hate he had known and fear but love so far eluded him why he did not know save that he had never been willing to perceive that emotion when offered in conventional forms and since no other forms were possible he had simply ceased to consider the matter yet marry some day he must of course but whom little he dreamed how soon he would know little did miss patricia wharton think that she had anything to do with it in fact patricia's thoughts at that time were far from matrimony patricia was bored for a month while wharton pear boiled out his gout at the sulphur springs patricia had dutifully sat and rocked tapping a small foot impatiently looking hourly less a monument of patience and smiling not at all at last they were in philadelphia wilson had opened two rooms at the house and a speedy termination of david wharton's business would have seen them soon at bar harbor but something went wrong at the office in chestnut street and patricia once a lamb and now a sheep of sacrifice found herself at this particular moment doomed to another weary week of waiting to make matters worse not a girl patricia knew was in town or if there were any the telephone refused to discover them her aunt's place was at haverford but she knew that an invitation to dinner there meant aged quaker cousins and that kind of creaky informality which shows a need of oil at the joints that lubricant patricia had no intention of supplying she had rather be bored alone than bored in company she found herself sighing for bar harbor as she had never sighed before she pictured the cottage cool and gray among the rocks the blue bowl of the sea with its rim just at her window ledge the clamoring surf and the briny smell with its faint suggestion of things cool and curious which came up newly breathed from the heart of the deep she could hear country girl whinnying impatience from the stable when jack masters on kentucky rode down from the pinnacle to inquire indeed as she walked out into the square in the afternoon she found herself relapsing into a minute and somewhat sordid introspection it was the weather perhaps surely the dog days had settled upon the sleepy city in earnest no breath stirred the famishing trees the smell of hot asphalt was in the air locusts buzzed vigorously everywhere trolley bells clanged out of tune and the sun was leaving a blood-hot trail across the sky in angry augury for the morrow patricia sank upon a bench and poked viciously at the walk with her parasol she experienced a certain grim satisfaction in being more than usually alone poor patricia who at the crooking of a finger could have summoned to her side any one of five estimable scions of stupid distinguished families only something new something difficult and extraordinary would lift her from the hopeless slough of despond into which she had found herself precipitated andromeda awaiting perseus on a bench in rittenhouse square she smiled widely and unrestrainedly up and precisely into the face of mr mortimer crabb End of chapter five chapter six of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva a pleasant face it was upon which to her surprise a smile very suddenly grew into being as though in response to her own patricia's eyes dropped quickly sedately as became those of a decorous woman 
and yet in that brief second in which the eyes of the tall young man met hers she had noticed that they were gray as though sun bleached but very clear and sparkling and when she raised her own to look quite through and beyond the opposite bench her conscience refused to deny that she had enjoyed the looking were the eyes smiling at or with her in that distinction lay a question in morals was their sparkle quizzical or intrusive she would have vowed that good humor benevolence if benevolence may be found in the eyes of two and thirty and a certain polite interest were its actual ingredients it was all very interesting she surprised herself in a not unlively curiosity as to his life and calling and in a lack of any sort of misgiving at the contretemps the shadows beneath the wilted trees grew deeper the sun swept down into the west and suddenly vanished with all his train of gold and purple patricia stole a furtive look at her neighbor triumphantly she confirmed her diagnosis the man was lost in the glow of the sunset importunity and he were miles asunder it may have been that patricia's eyes were more potent than the sunset or that her triumphant deduction was based upon a false premise or that the young man had been watching her all the while from the tail of his benevolent eye for without the slightest warning his head turned suddenly to find the eyes of the unfortunate patricia again fixed upon his however quickly she might turn aside the glance exchanged was long enough to disclose the fact that the sparkle was still there and to excite a suspicion that it had never been dispelled nor did the character of the smile reassure her she was not at all certain now that he was not smiling both with and at her the quickly averted head the toss of the chin seemed all too inadequate to the situation yet she availed herself of those bulwarks of maiden modesty in virtuous effort to refute the unconscious testimony of her unlucky eyes instinct suggested immediate flight but patricia moved not here indeed was a case where flight meant confession she felt rather than saw his gaze search her from head to foot and struggle as she might against it the warm color raced to her cheek and brow if she had enjoyed the situation a moment before the impertinence so suddenly born filled her with dismay by some subtle feminine process of reasoning she succeeded in eliminating her share in the trifling adventure and now saw only the sin of the offending male at last she arose the very presentment of injured and scornful dignity and walked looking neither to the left hand nor to the right there was a sound of firm rapid footsteps and then a deep voice at her elbow i beg pardon it was saying the lifted straw hat the inclined head the mellow tones the gray eyes again benevolent however unalarming in themselves filled her with very real inquietude whatever he had done before this surely was insupportable she was about to turn away when her eye fell upon his extended arm and upon her luckless parasol i beg pardon he repeated but isn't this yours the blood flew to her face again and it was with an embarrassment a gaucherie the like of which she could not remember that she extended her hand toward the errant sunshade no sound came from her lips with bent head she took it from him but as she walked on she found that he was walking too with her directly at her side for a moment she was cold with terror i hope you'll let me go along 
he was saying coolly i'm really quite harmless if you knew if you only knew how dreadfully bored i've been you really wouldn't mind me at all patricia stole a hurried glance at him her fears curiously diminished i'm what the fallen call a victim of circumstances he went on i ask no worse fate for my dearest enemy than to be consigned without a friend to this wilderness of whitened stoops and boarded doors to wait upon your city's demigod procrastination this i've done for forty-eight hours with a dear memory of a past but without a hope for the future if the fountain of youth were to gush hopefully from the office water cooler of my aged lawyer he would eye it askance and sigh for the lees of the turbid shul kill however she strove to lift her brows patricia was smiling now in spite of herself i've followed the meandering tide down the narrow canyon you call chestnut street watched the leisurely coal wagon and its attendant tale of trolleys or sat in my hotel striving to dust aside the accumulating cobwebs one small unquiet molecule of disconsolation i'm stranded marooned by comparison crusoe was gregarious during this while they were walking north all the way to chestnut street patricia was wondering whether to be most alarmed or amused of one thing she was assured she was bored no longer a sense of the violence done to her traditions hung like a millstone around her neck and yet patricia found herself peeping avidly through the hole to listen to the seductive voice of unconvention when patricia succeeded in summoning her voice she was not quite sure that it was her own you're an impertinent person she found herself saying can't you forgive no circumstances are against me he said but i give you my word i've a place in my own city a friend or two and a certain proclivity for virtue even if you do speak too strange but i don't it was the blessed parasol otherwise i shouldn't have dared and the proclivity for virtue why that's exactly the reason can't you see it was you you fairly exuded gentility come now i'm humility itself i've sinned how can i expiate by letting me go home to dinner patricia was laughing this time the man was looking at his watch what a brute i am he stopped took off his hat and turned away and here it was that some little frivolous genius put unmeditated words upon patricia's tongue i'm not so dreadfully hungry she said after all he had been impertinent so very courteously in a moment he was at her side again that was kind of you perhaps you've forgiven me no with rising inflection come now let's be friends just for this little while let's begin at once to believe we've known each other always just for to-night i will be getting out of town to-morrow and we won't meet again i'm certain of that how can i be sure patricia spoke as though thinking aloud they've promised me this time i'll go away to-morrow if my papers aren't ready i'll leave without them will you give me your word upon my honor patricia turned for the first time and looked directly up at him what value could she set upon the honor of one she knew not whatever the feminine process of examination she seemed satisfied what can i do it's almost dusk i was about to suggest uh, i thought perhaps you might be willing to uh, go and have a bite to eat in fact dinner patricia stopped and looked up at him in startled abstraction the word and its train of associated ideas evolved in significant fashion from her mental topsy-turvy dinner with a strange man in a public place the prosaic word took new and curious meanings unwritten upon the lexicon of her code 
there was the tangible presentation of her sin that she might read and run while there was yet time how had it all happened what had this insolent person said to make it possible for her to forget herself for so long with no word of explanation her small feet went hurrying down the hill while his big one strode protestingly alongside well he said at last but she gave him no answer and only walked the faster you're going home at once she spoke with cold incisiveness he walked along a few moments in silence then said assertively you're afraid for reply she only shook her head it's true he went on you're afraid a moment ago you were willing to forget we had just met now in a breath you're willing to forget that we've met at all but she would not answer he glanced at the poise of the haughty head just below his own was it mock virtue he felt thoroughly justified in believing it so they had reached a corner patricia stopped you'll let me go here won't you you'll not follow me or try to find out anything will you say you won't please please it has all been a dreadful mistake how dreadful i didn't know until until just now i must go alone you understand alone but it's getting dark you no no it doesn't matter i'm not afraid how can i be now please let me go alone good-bye and in a moment she had vanished in the cross street end of chapter six chapter seven of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva mortimer crabb watched the retreating figure hm he said the eternal question as usual without the answer and yet i would have sworn that that parasol in the square he had always possessed an attitude of amused and tolerant patronage for the city of brotherly love it was the birthright of any typical new yorker and yet since that inconsiderable adventure in rittenhouse square he had discovered undreamed of virtues in the pennsylvania metropolis it was a city not of apartments but of homes homes in which men lived with their families and brought up interesting children in the old-fashioned way a city of conservative progress of historic association of well-guarded tradition an american city in short which new york was not at the bachelor's club he sang its praises and mentioned a plan of wintering there but was laughed at for his pains anything unusual and extraordinary was to be expected of mortimer crabb but a winter in philadelphia this was too preposterous crabb said nothing in reply he only smiled politely and when the blue wing was put in commission went off on a cruise with no other company but his thoughts and captain jepson jepson under ordinary circumstances would have been sufficient but now mortimer crabb spent much time in a deck-chair reading in a book of poems or idly gazing at the swirl of foam in the vessel's wake jepson wondered what he was thinking of for crabb was not a man to spend much time in dreaming and the captain would have given much that he possessed to know he would have been surprised if mortimer crabb had told him to tell the truth crabb was thinking of a parasol he was wondering if after all his judgment had been erring the lady in the square had left the parasol it was true but then all the tribe of parasols and umbrellas seemed born to the fate of being neglected and forgotten and there was no reason why this particular specimen of the genus should be exempt from the frailties of its kind as he remembered it was a flimsy thing of green silk and lace obviously a french frippery which might be readily guilty of such a form of naughtiness 
it had long worried him to think that he might have misjudged the sleeping princess as he had learned to call her and he knew that it would continue to worry him until he proved the matter one way or another for himself had she really forgotten the parasol or had she not forgotten it the cruise ended the summer lengthened into fall and winter found mortimer crabb established in residence at a fashionable hotel in philadelphia letters had come from new york to certain philadelphia dowagers in the councils of the mighty to the end that in due course crabb accepted for several desirable dinners and before he knew he found himself in the full swing of a social season and so when the night of the assembly came around he found himself dining at the house of one of his sponsors in a party wholly given over to the magnification of three tremulous young female persons who were to receive their cachet and certificate of eligibility in attending that ancient and honorable function it was just at the top of the steps leading to the foyer of the ballroom that crabb met patricia wharton in the crowd face to face the encounter was unavoidable he saw the brief question in her glance before she placed him the vanishing smile the momentary pallor and then was conscious that she had gone by her eyes looking past him her brow slightly raised her lips drawn together the very letter of indifference and contempt it was cutting advanced to the dignity of a fine art crabb felt the color rise to his temples and heard the young bud at his side saying what is it mr crabb you look as if you'd seen the ghost of all your past transgressions all of them miss cheston oh i hope i don't look as bad as that he laughed only one a very tiny one to tell me cried the bud first let's safely run the gauntlet of the lorgnons when the party was assembled and past the grenadiers who jealously guard the sacred inner bulwarks crabb was glad to relinquish his companion to another while he sought seclusion behind a bank of azaleas to watch the moving dancers so she really was somebody he began for a moment to doubt the testimony of the vagrant glances and the guilty parasol could he have been mistaken had she really forgotten the parasol after all the situation was brutal enough for her and he was quite prepared to respect her delicacy what he did resent was the way in which she had done it she had taken to cover angrily and stood at bay with all her woman's weapons sharpened the curl of lip the narrowed eye bespoke of a degree of disdain quite out of proportion to the offence but he made a rapid resolution not to seek her or meet her eye if his was the fault it was the only reparation he could offer her as he whirled around the room with his little bud he caught a glimpse of her upon the opposite side and so manoeuvred that he would come no nearer when he had guided his partner to a seat it did not take him long to gratify a very natural curiosity will you tell me he asked who no don't look now the girl in the black spangly dress is who where asked miss cheston patricia you mean of course miss wharton my cousin haven't you met her uh, no she's good-looking isn't she and the dearest creature but rather cold and the least bit prim Pri oh really yes we're quakers you know she belongs to the older set perhaps that's why she seems a trifle cold and uh, conventional convent oh yes of course you know we're really quite a breezy lot if you only know us some of this year's deaths are really very dreadful how shocking and miss wharton is not dreadful oh dear no but she is awfully good fun 
come you must meet her let me take you over but good fortune in the person of stephen ventnor intervened it was the unexpected which was to happen crabb was returning from the table with a favor his eye ran along the line of chairs in a brief fruitless search mr barclay who was leading the cotillion caught his eye at this precise psychological moment stranded crabb let me present you to he mentioned no name but was off in a moment winding in and out among those on the floor crabb followed when he had succeeded in eluding the imminent dancers and had reached the other side of the room there was barclay bending over awfully nice chap stranger he was saying and then aloud miss wharton may i present mr crabb it was all over in a moment the crowded room had hidden the black dress and the fair hair but it was too late barclay was off in a second and there they were looking again into each other's eyes patricia pale and cold as stone crabb a trifle ill at ease at the awkward situation which however appearances were against him was none of his choosing crabb inclined his head and extended the hand which carried his favor they both glanced down seeking in that innocent trinket a momentary refuge from the predicament it was then for the first time that crabb discovered the thing he was offering her a little frivolous green silk parasol she looked up at him again her eyes blazing but she rose to her feet and looked around her as though seeking some mode of escape he fully expected that she would refuse to dance and was preparing to withdraw as gracefully as he might when with chin erect and eyes which looked and carried her spirit quite beyond him she took the parasol and followed him upon the floor but the subtlety of suggestion which seemed to possess crabbe's particular little comedy was to be still more amusingly developed the figure in which they became a part was a pretty vari-coloured whirl of flowers and ribbons in which the green parasols were destined to play a part for a miniature maypole was brought and the parasols were fastened to the depending ribbons in accordance with their colour as the figure progressed and the dancers interwove crabbe could not fail to note the recurrent intentional snub he felt himself blameless in the unlucky situation and this needless display of hostility so clearly expressed seemed made in very bad taste each time he passed the flaunted shoulder the upcast chin or curling lip he found his humility to be growing less and less until as the dance neared its end he glowed with a very righteous ire if she had meant to deny him completely she should have chosen the opportunity when he had first come up and as he passed her he rejoiced in the discovery that she had inadvertently chosen the other end of the ribbon attached to the very parasol which he bore when the may dance was over miss wharton found mr crabbe at her side handing her the green parasol precisely as he had handed her that other one in the square six months before i beg pardon he was saying quizzically but isn't this yours the accent and benevolent eye were unmistakable if there were any arrow in her quiver of scorn unshot his effrontery completely disarmed her if looks could have killed crabbe must have died at once assured of the depths of his infamy she could only murmur rather faintly i shall go to my seat at once please indeed crabbe was a very lively corpse he was smiling coolly down at her certainly if you wish it only er uh, i hope you'll let me go along how she hated him 
the words uttered again with the same smiling effrontery seemed to be burned anew into her memory could she never be free from this inevitable man her seat was at the far end of the room i think you have done me some injustice he said quietly and then it has been a pleasant dance thank you so much thank you replied patricia acidly and he was gone end of chapter seven chapter eight of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva miss wharton rather crossly dismissed her weary maid and threw herself into an armchair odious situation her peccadillo had found her out what made the matter still worse was the ingenuous impeccability of her villain on every hand she heard his praises sung and it vexed her that she had been unable to contribute anything to his detriment of course after seeing her leave the parasol it would have been stupid of him to to let her forget it in her thoughts that adventure had long since been condoned it was this new rencontre which had so upset her it angered her to think how little delicacy he gave her credit for when he had asked jack barclay to present him if they had met by chance it would have been different she would have been sharply civil but not retrospective and would have trusted to his sense of the situation to be the same that he had assailed her helpless barriers wrote him down a brute divested him of all the garments of sensibility in which she had clothed him it angered her to think that her fancy had seen fit to make him any other than he was but mingled with her anger she was surprised to discover disappointment too it was this this person who shared with her the secret of her one iniquity she pulled impatiently at her long gloves and arose with an air of finality and so miss wharton put the importunate mr crabb entirely from her mind until the following thursday night at the dinner at the hollingsworth patty dear have you met mr crabb mrs hollingsworth was saying miss wharton had at the assembly mr crabb politely echoed and patricia hated him for the nebulous smile which seemed to contain hidden meanings but she rose to the occasion in a way which seemed to disconcert her companion who only answered her rapid fire of commonplaces in monosyllables at the table she found her refuge upon the other side to be an italian from the embassy at washington whose french limped but whose english was a cripple and so they minced and stuttered ollendorf fashion through the oysters and soup while crabb occupied himself with the daughter of the house upon his other side but at last patty was aware that mr crabb was speaking miss wharton he began i fear i've been put somewhat under a cloud really she answered sweetly how so a little disconcerted but undismayed he continued because of the manner of our meeting our meeting she said uncertainly at the assembly you know i thought perhaps that you thought uh, i'd asked to be presented didn't you then how did we happen to meet he could not but admire her sans foi she was smiling a non-committal smile at the centerpiece uh, i should explain i was adrift and barclay came to my rescue i give you my word i had no notion it was to you he was taking me it was all over in a second then you really didn't wish to meet me i'm so sorry she had turned her face slowly to his and was looking him levelly in the eyes it was a challenge not a petition he met her thrust fairly my dear miss wharton he smiled how could i know what you were like uh, if i'd never seen you this time he fairly set her weapon flying what i wish you to understand he continued steadily 
is that i didn't know that barclay was taking me to you i wish credit for a certain delicacy i should not have cared to force myself upon you i'm sure i shouldn't have minded in the least she said lightly i'm not so difficult as all that as soon as she had spoken she knew she had overshot her mark that's awfully good of you you know i'm sure you'll admit i had no means of knowing he added how difficult you were she flushed a little before returning to the attack of course a girl wishes to know a little something about a man before before she permits herself to misjudge him he smiled candidly do you feel in any better position to judge me now than you did before before the assembly she interrupted i think so you don't eat with your knife laughing you've a respect for the napkin people say you're clever why shouldn't i believe them if this is your creed of morality i'm respectability itself can you doubt me why won't you be frank if i'm respectable why shouldn't you have cared to meet me i'm not sure i thought very much about it how did you know i didn't wish to meet you how could i know you did she looked up at him a new expression on her face i didn't she said quietly i i abhorred the very thought of you crabb looked contemplatively at his truffle i thank you for your candor he replied at last then after a pause if you'll forgive me i'll promise not to mention the subject again and if i don't forgive you you're at my mercy for this hour at least <laughs> he laughed i can still fly to italy she replied i could forgive you i think but for one thing he looked the question this dinner is it to chance that i'm indebted for the the honor of your society crabbe's gaze had dropped to the table but she had seen just such a sparkle in them once before nor when he looked at her had it disappeared you mean she continued gazing at him steadily you mean did i arrange it he asked patricia bowed her head how could i have done so he urged isn't nick hollingsworth an intimate friend of yours yes but i fail to see will you deny it i'm afraid you'll have to take me a little on faith he pleaded at any rate you will not suffer long i'm leaving town in a few days for long she asked politely for good i think won't you let me come in to see you before then perhaps but mrs hollingsworth had cast her glance down the line and drawn back her chair when the men came down into the drawing-room mr crabbe discovered that miss wharton had carefully ensconced herself in the centre of a perimeter of skirts which defied disintegration and apportionment there was music and afterwards a call for carriages so mr crabbe saw no more of miss wharton upon that night nor indeed did patricia see him again the following day he called she was out then came a note and some roses business had called him sooner than he had expected he begged to assure her of his distinguished consideration would she forgive him now that he was gone accept this new impertinence and forget all those that had gone before patricia accepted the impertinence and for many days it filled her little white room with seductive odors that made his last admonition more difficult end of chapter eight chapter nine of the maker of opportunities by george gibbs this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tony oliva the months of winter passed and crabbe returned not july found the whartons again at bar harbor patricia would go out for hours in her canoe or her sailboat 
rejoicing with bronzed cheek and hardening muscles in the buffets and caresses of frenchman's bay it was a very tiny catboat that she had learned to manage herself and in which she would tolerate no male hand at the helm except in the stiffest blows one quiet afternoon early in august she was sailing alone down toward sorrento it was one of those brilliant new england days when every detail of water and sky shone clear as amethyst here and there a sail cut a sharp yellow rhomboid from the velvet woods patricia listened idly to the lapping of the tiny waves and found herself thinking again rather uncomfortably of the one person who had caught her off her guard and kept her there if he had only stayed in philadelphia one week more she could have at least retired with drums beating and colors flying a sound distracted her she looked to leeward under the lifting sail and on her bow well out in the open off stave island she could make out the lines of an overturned canoe and two figures in the water she quickly loosed the sheet and shifted her helm and bore down rapidly upon the unfortunates she could see a man bearing upon one end of the canoe lifting the other into the air trying to get the water out but each time he did so a bull terrier dog swam to the gunwale and overturned it again she sped by to leeward and skilfully turning her little craft upon its heel came up into the wind alongside how do you do said the moistful person smiling the hair was streaked down into his eyes he hardly wondered that she didn't recognize him mr crabb she said at last rather faintly how did you happen it was the dog he said cheerfully i thought he understood canoes he might have drowned you why it's jack masters teddy she cried here teddy come aboard at once sir she bent over the low freeboard and by dint of much hauling managed to get him in in the meantime the catboat had drifted away from the canoe crabb had at last succeeded in getting in and was now bailing with his cap won't you come over shouted patricia oh i'm all right he returned it was the dog i was worried about then for the first time he was aware that the paddle had drifted off and was now floating a hundred yards away i'm sorry but my paddle is adrift so patricia amid much barking from the rejuvenated teddy came alongside again there sat the bedraggled and dripping crab in three inches of water his empty hands upon the gunwales looking rather foolishly up at the blue eyes that were smiling rather whimsically down she could not resist the temptation to banter him had she prayed for vengeance nothing could have been sent to her sweeter than this you look rather um, glum she said i'm not he replied calmly i've not been so happy in months what on earth is there to prevent my sailing off and leaving you she laughed nothing he said i'm all right i'll swim for the paddle when i'm rested have you thought i might take that with me too she asked sweetly all right he laughed trying to suppress the chattering teeth somebody'll be along presently don't be too sure you're really very much at my mercy you were not always so unkind mr crabb patricia retired in confusion to the tiller you're impudent she hauled in her sheet and the boat gathered headway please miss wharton please he shouted but patricia did not move from the tiller and the catboat glided off he watched her sail down and recover the paddle and then head back toward him won't you forgive me and take me in i suppose i must but i'm sure i'd rather you'd drown i'm hardly in the mood for coals of fire i am though he chattered i'm deucedly cold you don't deserve it but if you were drowned i suppose i'd be to blame 
i wouldn't have you on my conscience again for anything then please take me on your boat will you behave yourself i'll try and never again refer to to mm. then please come in out of the wet it was toward the end of august when the south-east wind had raised a gray and thunderous sea the two persons sat under the lee of a rock near great head and watched the giant breakers shatter themselves to foam they sat very close together and the little they said was drowned in the roar of the elements but they did not care they were willing just to sit and watch the fruitless struggles of the swollen waters won't you tell me said the girl at last about that dinner didn't you really ask mrs hollingsworth to send you in with me the man looked amusedly off at the jagged horizon no i really didn't he said and then after a pause with a laugh but <laughs> nick did why did sepulchre said the girl another pause this time the man questioned there is another thing uh, won't you tell me about the parasol last summer did you forget it really or or just leave it mortimer she cried flushing furiously i didn't but he assisted her in hiding her face smiling down benevolently the while really honestly truly he said softly i didn't i didn't she repeated didn't what he still persevered she looked up at him for a moment flushed more furiously than before and sought refuge anew but the muffled reply was perfectly distinguishable to the man i i didn't forget it but the great head rocks didn't hear thus mortimer crabb having spent much of his time in making opportunities for other people had at last succeeded in making one for himself he had the pleasure of knowing too that he was also making one for patty not that this was miss wharton's first opportunity for every one knew that her rather sedate demeanor concealed a capricious coquetry which she could no more control than she could the music of the spheres but this was going to be a different kind of opportunity for crabb had decided that not only was she going to be engaged to him but that when the time came she was going to marry him this decision reached he spent all his time in convincing her that he was the one man in the world exactly suited to her protean moods the sum of his possessions had not been made known to her and he delighted in planning his surprise so that when the blue wing appeared in the harbor he invited her for a sail in her own catboat calmly took the helm in spite of her protests and before she was aware of it had made a neat landing at his own gangway jepson poked his head over the side and welcomed them grinning broadly and following crabb's inviting gesture patricia went up on deck feeling very much like the lady who had married the lord of burleigh then jepson gave some mysterious orders and before long she was reclining luxuriously in a deck chair and the blue wing was breasting the surges which showed the way to the open sea all of this quoted crabb gaily with a fine gesture which comprehended the whole of the north atlantic ocean is mine and thine it's very nice of you to be so rich why didn't you tell me said patricia because i had a certain pride in wanting you to like me for myself you think i would have married you for your money oh yes he said promptly of course you would a rich man has about as much chance of entering the kingdom of romance as the biblical camel has to get through the eye of the needle why is it then that i find you so very much more attractive now that i've found the blue wing but you found me first he laughed did i archly if you still doubt it there's the parasol the mention of the parasol always silenced her End of chapter nine